Welcome. So should we kick this thing off? Yes. This is going to be a fairly interactive session, so you're going to have to do some thinking. I know it's late in the day. Uh, is this the last session, or is there one more? Yeah, so let's uh, finish thing off, this thing off strong. Uh, so this is a talk I created. Uh, it's called Secure DevOps. We're going to talk about DevOps and maybe some common security mistakes that, that I see, and then I'll also introduce you to a tool that we created that is open source and free to address some security issues we saw in a DevOps deployment. So my name, contact info is up on the screen. Um, I'll show it again at the end, but if I have not met you before, I've met many of you in the past. My name is Eric Johnson. I kind of have two different jobs. I know I'm weird. I like to just work twice as much as normal people. But I, I have a consultancy called Cyber State of Defense where I focus mainly on application security. So I do testing of web apps, mobile apps, uh, IoT apps in some cases, uh, some thin and thick clients. Uh, for the most part over the last year, I've done almost all secure development lifecycle consulting, which is going into organizations and helping them do security day in and day out from the beginning of an iteration or a cycle versus maybe waiting to the very end and calling us AppSec folks and saying, hey, by the way, do you think we should worry about security? Which uh, historically does not work out very well for you when you push things to prod and you have not done any security whatsoever. So when I'm not doing that, I about 30, 40% of the year teach for the SANS Institute. I author uh, two different courses for them, one on mobile app security, another one on .NET security. I also teach a Java secure coding class and we have a secure DevOps class, which is a lot of automation and how security needs to kind of land in code across an organization and rather than our historical network and operations type of uh, role. So that's me in a nutshell. I live here in Des Moines, so this is like my favorite conference to speak at because I don't have to get on an airplane to go to it, which is very nice. So here's our agenda for the next 45, 50 minutes. We'll kind of see how we do. Uh, I'm going to go through a little bit of a case study and introduce you to what I see often in a quote DevOps environment. Then I'll talk about some static analysis options for this client that we had and walk you through what you should be doing as development engineers or writing code pre-commit and then also what should be happening in your CI pipelines and then we'll kind of tie things up a little bit. So. Let's talk about the, the case study first. If you've ever seen me do a talk, I always lead off with some sort of uh, example of why you should care about what I'm going to mention for the rest of the talk. So as I'm going through this, just keep in mind, this is why we did what we did. So I can't really tell you publicly who this customer was or is, uh, but I can give you their industry. They're in the travel industry. And it might be an airline company with roughly 5,000 employees. They have roughly 50 .NET C Sharp applications. Many of them are internet facing. So prime attack surface for all of the, who's a hacker in the room, anybody? Anybody love to break stuff? So there's a few of you. And let's see, who's on the defense side? Is anybody on the blue team? Only one? Blue team doesn't get any of the glory, man. I'm with you. It's easier to break stuff. What about, who, what else do you guys do? Is anybody, we've got some managers in the room, I assume, some that are just interested in maybe high level. This will be good because you'll see kind of what you should be thinking about as you work with your engineering teams. Students, students, you guys look like you're, you're taking notes and stuff, which tells me you're very collegiate at the moment. So they've got roughly 20 software engineers that work for this company that are supporting these 50 apps. Guess how many AppSec folks they had? None. Now, everyone knows the ratio. If you look at the BSIM 7 report that is published by Sigital every year, their study from 2016, actually, the ratio across about 80 different enterprises is about one AppSec engineer for 225 development engineers. So that's, you know, at 50, we're not quite to that 220 yet. So that's why they have none. And they're deploying code once a week. So that's the scenario that we walked into. And... Security was never really discussed until we had this slew of travel industry breaches that have popped up here over the last five years or so. Uh, Omni Resorts lost about 50,000 credit cards. Does anyone see like Marriott slash Starwood had that same point of sale malware that happened to Target and Home Depot and those folks. So we're stealing credit cards there. 
United Airlines, um, they have their own slew of problems that have happened within the last week with deplaning folks, but they did actually open a bug bounty program about a year, maybe two years ago. Did anybody do any bug bounty testing against United's applications? No? You should have, because you could have got a million frequent flyer miles. Uh, the gentleman, his name is Jordan Weiss, I think was his name. He did testing for six hours, got remote code execution on United's server and earned a million frequent flyer miles. So that's pretty cool, right? That's why this company reached out to us and said, we might need to consider application security. I mean, we should have all along. We can kind of, we're all smiling. But a lot of big companies don't do this. So this is the state that they were in when I found them. And to make things worse, they're doing DevOps. Who is working in a DevOps shop? I know we talked a little bit earlier. We got at least one hand. This is this whole notion that we can automate all of the things and engineers can do a git commit and push code into a repository and then it's auto-magically built and pushed straight into a production environment at the click of a button. Does that sound concerning to anyone? Yes, it should. So, this is the state they were in when I kind of first started looking at their development life cycle. Now, this is a hypothetical application called Widget Town that I will walk you through here in a little bit. But this is basically it. We pull from Git, we compile the app, and if it works, we're going to publish that build to a repository that's automatically pushed into the dev testing and production environment. So that's what we walked into. So what's the state of security there? I'll tell you on the next slide, but what are you thinking right now? Non-existent, and they have zero AppSec folks, so at least that's adding up. There's no one to help guide them. So what's the state of security in this only DevOps world? So if you walk into an organization and they're doing DevOps, security is a little slow to the game. Has anyone kind of run into that in their organization? We're seemingly two steps behind all of these software engineers that are using a new JavaScript framework every week. A new one comes out and they just start firing that out there and say, this is awesome, we'll use that. I think security is, I'm pushing my code out using a secure process. Sure. And not necessarily the code I'm writing is, is secure. Yeah, so if the process is secure, for those listening at home, then it must be secure, right, from a, from a code perspective. Yes. And we kind of talked about, I don't, was it Tom that said it earlier? I can't remember, where he's like, if you break the build because you changed a line of code and you never actually ran it to see if it works, you're buying beer for like six months on Fridays for everybody. So it, that goes along with this. So security in this organization, they were bringing in external consultants. They're doing the standard, let's run a Fortify or, you know, I'm, I'm not going to call out which tool it was, but some sort of commercial scanning tool that's going to generate a 500 page PDF with a bunch of problems in it. And they're just going to send that PDF file off to the engineers and say, here's all your problems. How do you think that goes? Not well. Not well. Who's going to look at that? Box checked. Box checked. That's a perfect way to describe this. So this is kind of how security is set up at this moment with this bleeding edge DevOps pipeline automating code pushes to production. So if you actually do an assessment, by the time you get that PDF and you send it to somebody, it's probably been more than a week that has passed. The code has already been changed. The code has already been pushed out to production. And now your results are effectively worthless at that point because you need to go run another scan. So this is not going to scale well. And I've actually seen in real life, and you'll laugh, one software engineer that paid attention to that report and they printed the entire 600 page PDF off. So I walked across the office and it's just this stack of papers sitting on his desk and he's just flipping one page at a time. Oh, there's the file and the line of code and he'd go over to his machine and he'd change it. And then he'd flip to the next page. I'm like, how long is that going to take? you would be here for months doing this. So here's the problem. This whole DevOps thing is great. And security absolutely can get involved in this, but usually we're not really invited to this party is how I like to phrase it. So we've got all these nice automation tools, but the internal security team maybe doesn't have a development background so they understand how to work with a lot of these tools. So 95% of InfoSec 
comes from an operations and an infrastructure background. So when you sit a typical InfoSec person down and you say, you're going to do AppSec this week, and I need you to go write a bunch of unit tests to test for security requirements, how does that usually go? Not well. And in most organizations, that security person is sitting up on the ninth floor, all the software engineers are up all, you know, down on the second floor, and they don't even know who each other are. So they can't work together to iron this stuff out. So it doesn't get you very far. We have frequent deployments. I already mentioned invalidate your assessments. The point I'm making here is that if we use a developer mindset from the AppSec perspective, these pipelines actually offer us a huge opportunity as far as application security is concerned. We can do a lot of basic scanning that can eliminate a lot of that low hanging fruit that always seems to end up being the reason that someone loses 10 million records out of their database, something of that nature. So we can do better is my point. Let's take a peek at an HPE survey. So here's how application security and DevOps are actually being commingled at the moment. So if you can see the chart, I'll go through what's what. So this was published in October, 2016. The release frequency is up 30 times in a DevOps environment. So we're pushing code much more often. The problem is that these silos between AppSec and, uh, AppSec and development still exist. So in this survey, we've got the red evil piece of the pie chart. 17% of these organizations doing DevOps are doing nothing for security in their DevOps pipelines, which is very concerning because we've taken a problem that at least gave us a chance to catch with a gated release, and now we've removed that gate. So we're just freely pushing any sort of vulnerability into production without even thinking about it. The next part, 25%, because most of security comes from an infrastructure background, 25% of these DevOps companies are actually just addressing AppSec at a network layer, which means what? We're turning on a WAF, maybe. And they block everything, right? Has anybody done an audit on WAF rules before to see what they actually do find? Tom's nodding. Anything good or worthwhile? You know, it depends. Depends. A lot of the ones that I've gone and looked at, yeah, we have a WAF, and we spent X number of thousands of dollars on this WAF, and we plugged it in, and no one knew how to configure it. So it's sitting there in passive mode, not actually blocking anything. That's how I've seen it deployed almost every single time I've gone to look at it. So you have a big shiny object that's very expensive and you're not actually using it. Then we've got the other side of it where let's write a custom rule that blocks ticker one equals one. I've actually seen that in a, in a WAF rule before. And then I looked at the person and I said, well, what if I put in ticker two equals two? Oh, we have a problem here. So those defenses are not going to make up for pretty much secure application development is what I'll call it. Then we've got the 38%, which is at least promising that there is at least a gated release. So we still have an opportunity to locate problems before we push to production. And then there's 20%, which are actually doing security scanning in the pipeline. So that's kind of the distribution right now. The organization that we're working with that we kind of started, we're, they're definitely in the red piece of the pie, doing nothing. So what we need to do is actually break down these walls. That's what this whole DevOps concept is all about. So security needs to get involved in several ways. Now, security from the development perspective needs to understand the tools that software engineers are actually using. I'm amazed at how many InfoSec folks I know that cannot commit a change to Git. It's impressive. So you have to learn how to use source control because all security is going to slowly start being baked into code, which is great. You have to understand the CI tools, whether it's Jenkins, Bamboo, Team City, Travis, AWS Code Pipeline. I don't really care which one you're using. InfoSec and AppSec have to understand how those things work in order to actually wire security into the process. How about operations? The ops folks need to start learning code from a infrastructure perspective. We can start actually writing out chef recipes or puppet manifests or whatever it is. You can start burning your infrastructure into code. And then the line of business 
can actually get involved as well and they can start understanding or with security and maybe we can start actually talking to the business about security so we don't have to say no to everything. Maybe some things are okay to actually go to production as long as we have some compensating controls in place. So that's really the whole goal of everything. This next slide is very noisy. There, these are all of the things, there are many of them, from a security perspective that should be happening during our four phases of DevOps. You kind of boil everything down to pre-commit, which is before we've actually committed code, during the commit, which is when you're starting your build pipeline, acceptance testing, which is automated in your build pipeline, and then deployment. So there's a number of things on here. Obviously, risk assessment, threat modeling, you've got static analysis in the mix, which is what we'll dive into here in a moment. During the commit phase, there are things like putting automated alerting on high-risk code changes that should trigger security peer reviews. That sort of thing absolutely has to be in a DevOps pipeline to call it a secure DevOps pipeline. Acceptance testing should be automating all sorts of abuse cases and abuser security stories. You have to burn those into code and you can start actually making sure your security requirements are also baked into those same sort of tests. After deployment, because we are elevating our risk by automating all of these things and maybe not catching everything, you need to put in more monitoring. Your applications have to have little mini intrusion detection systems built into them. So if you get a whole bunch of incorrect password attempts in a short period of time on your login page, you had better have a graph or hip chat notifications or Slack notifications going out to inform the people that need to know about it as the attack is happening. So you're putting in some protective measures in your application source code. Those are the types of things that we could talk about this for a week. We will narrow this down because we've only got about, well, I don't know what, 25 minutes left to IDE static analysis and CI static analysis because that is the first place that I said, let's start there with this organization. Now, the days of being able to actually just kick off a commercial tool, for example, that take eight hours to run, they're not going to work here. And you cannot turn on all of the rules and overwhelm folks with 100,000 false positives because that is also going to kind of turn the software engineers against you, per se. Has anybody seen that happen? Where they look at that report and they say, I'm not doing this. This isn't in my job title. Why do I care about it? So you have to make them fast. They need to be as accurate as possible, which most traditional AppSec folks will say, well, you're neutering the tool if you turn off all of the rules. And I'm not saying we're going to throw those scans away. I'm telling you they do not belong in a DevOps pipeline blocking up everything. Those need to happen out of band as regularly as you want them to happen. And those results can be fed back into the backlog systems. We're trying to eliminate the top low-hanging fruit issues like SQL injection and cross-site scripting that should absolutely never, ever, ever enter a production environment. That's what should be happening at this phase. So remember, this organization is in all .NET shop. So that was the first conversation we had. They said, we don't have money for commercial tools. Those are out. What do you have available that's free and open source? Has anybody looked for that in the Microsoft.net world before? The options are pretty crappy. They're terrible. So I started scanning some things, and I knew this ahead of time, but I wanted to prove to them uh, that it was actually bad. So what I said is, here's cat.net, here's fxcop, another analyzer, and there's some web config analyzers out there that you can use. And I have this vulnerable target called Widget Town that has a bunch of vulnerabilities in it, and I use it to benchmark scanners. So if I'm evaluating a commercial product, I scan it against this and I know that there's at least 75 vulnerabilities in it and when it reports six back, then I know it sucks. So you, and I know when you woke up this morning that you really wanted to do a code review because everybody wakes up and actually enjoys doing that, right? So you are going to get to do that here. So this is some of the code within this application. Now we're only going to go through about six files. So I'll let you tell me what the problem is. And if you don't know .NET, that's okay. This is reading an object from a database and this is writing it out to HTML. What top 10 vulnerability is that? Does anybody know? Yeah. 
not SQL injection. HTML injection or cross-site scripting was the common name for it. So this is stored cross-site scripting where it's sitting in a database. Let's take a peek at the next one here. This gets fun. Now, this is about as blatantly obvious as it can get. <laughs> ID is coming from a REST API parameter and we're just blindly concatenating that into a SQL statement. That is pretty much an example that probably still exists in a book in my office somewhere that was written in 2002 when it said, here's how you query information from a database from a web page. That's pretty much what they all used to say. And that's how we ended up in the predicament that we're in today. That's a different story. Okay, so I've, there's two. This one, a dynamic file name, and it's concatenated into a file path and downloaded off the file system. What do you think on that one? All right, directory traversal, path manipulation, whatever you want to call it. Okay, here is a method that signs in a user. And this is actually the default template that .NET creates for you when you say, I would like to do authentication. And it has this parameter called should lockout set to false. What do you think that does? Right, so that rocky list that I was just running against Tom's encrypted file forever. You could run that against the login page and actually get into the system. So that's another problem. Here's one that I see quite a bit. The comment kind of gives it away, hint, hint. <laughs> so we have no certificate validation. And I'll show you one more. And this one is a little bit trickier. So let me zoom in on this a little bit. So select star from contest where contest ID equals. What does that look like it is? So we've got some more SQL injection, but let's take a peek at the init or the variable type real quick. So that's actually an integer. So the scanner will typically mess up on this because I can't put injection commands into an integer. So this is a false positive, and I just wanted to show you that this existed because we're going to see how to address this here in a little bit. So, and there's lots more problems in here. I'm not going to give everything away. Let's take a quick look at how these free and open source scanners did during our assessment of them. So Microsoft cat.net was created in 2009 and has not been updated since then. How good do you think this is? Not so good. So here's the results. Run it with PowerShell. I found two cross-site scripting issues and one unvalidated redirect issue. That's what it came back with. So three problems. Now, we just manually walked through six of them together. So you know there's a lot more in there than that. Let's take another quick look at FXCOP, which was basically more of a style checking tool. It does have some security rules built into it, but it's not going to find things that a normal security scanner should. So that is wrapped around Visual Studio Code Analysis, which is just a menu bar in the IDE where you can say, scan this code. So they wrapped that up into that functionality. And here's what they found. Two SQL injection instances, one of them is a false positive. So that's what we're looking at for the free and open source tools. So here's a nice little table that summarizes what we found. Two cross-site scriptings, one SQL injection, one false positive, and one unvalidated redirect. So if you had to grade this, what would you give it based on what I just showed you? Yes. Right, not very good. So. The question is, what else can we use? And this is where I had an interesting conversation with a colleague named Mark, who's like a diehard Microsoft person. He's like the only person I know that, that has a Windows phone. So does anybody in here have a Windows phone? There's usually one. We talked about this this morning. There Nobody. Was right there was one in here at some point today. I remember it. So Mark tells me, hey, have you heard of Rosalind? And I go, who's Rosalind? No, no, it's a code name for this open source compiler API that Microsoft released to us. And I said, no, what is it? And he said, basically, you have an API now that lets you query the entire .NET compiler as code is being parsed in the IDE or during the build. And it allows you to actually set a diagnostic, which is the underlying squiggles you see on the slide at any location in the source code file. I said, well, that sounds interesting. So what's going through your head right now? Or at least I'm weird. I know what was going through my head when he told me about it was I bet I could write some security rules to actually 
do better than these other options and flag them in the IDE as engineers are writing code. How cool would that be? That's as early as you can get in the vulnerability cycle is to stop them from being written in the first place. So that's step one. Step two is that they're also reported during the build compilation. So you get a bunch of warnings that reflect what is being squiggled in the code. And that information is available to you as you run a build in a build pipeline. So that's checkbox number two. Now in Jenkins or whatever your CI server is, if we plug these rules in, we have scanning going on and we can make informed decisions on the health of the application from a security perspective based on the warnings showing up at compile time. So that's win number two. So I'm not going to tell you how to build these rules. There's actually a talk that I did last fall that I'll give you a link to here in a moment. If you're interested in writing these, there's an awesome MSDN article where he walks you through, Alex Turner sets everything up, here's what you need to install, and here's how you can write your first rule, and he goes in and teaches you how to find invalid regular expressions in code. And you walk through the process. If you're interested in the talk that I gave, it's out on YouTube. It was recorded at AppSec USA in DC last fall. The link is on the slide. Also, there's an open source repository on, uh, or that's mine, the GitHub repo, where I've got some sample analyzers that you can play with there. If you're interested in learning how to actually write these. I'll post these slides somewhere and I'll talk to the B-Sides folks and they'll tweet it. So they'll tell you where, the, where they are. Fast forward six months after I talked to Mark and I've got an open source tool. It is also in GitHub that has about 50 different rules that myself and a few other people have been just slowly adding to this to try and fill that gap in the .NET world to give us what will be a decent open source tool for scanning source code, which is great. So, you know, Java has their own, you know, they've got fine security bugs. Our Ruby folks have Breakman, which is also awesome. Our goal was to try to create something that people in .NET could use and not have to pay anything for it because security shouldn't really be at the expense of paying for a massively expensive commercial tool, in my opinion. So what do our results look like? Same source code that I scanned with FXCOP and cat.net. We've got a total of 66 findings, which is getting there. That's covering most of the things that I know about in the app. 56 of them are valid, 10 are false positives. So we'll never get away with false positives not being there. That's just not possible in the world of analysis. But I will show you a way to suppress these and then you can move on your way and never see it again at the same time. So let's take a look at what the scanner actually is doing here. So I've got another instance of Visual Studio open. And it's got this NuGet package installed. So all you have to do is go into your project, say install package puma.security.rules. It will download it from NuGet and it'll install it and start running these rules right there in your pipeline. Pretty cool. So the same issues I showed you earlier, notice what we've got on that line of code. It's basically telling you unencoded label.txt property. And down in our actual warnings, we've got the full description. There's also each of these link out to our site. Let me see if my VM's online. So you click on it and it takes you straight into the documentation that tells you here's the bad thing that happened. And off to the right, Here's what the insecure code snippet looks like. And then here's what a secure example would look like. I'm trying to make this as easy as possible for our software folks to fix things as they pop up. So every single issue will link out to the documentation that explains what, why, and how to fix it. I can tell you, it takes me longer to write up the documentation than it does to actually write the rule to find the bad thing, unfortunately. So, what we're going to do is commit some code here. I'm just going to kick this off. So let me go in and let's see my changes. And let's just say we installed Puma scan and I'm going to commit them and I'll push them out to my repo and I'll kind of show you what's going on in the background here. So as I commit, I've got Jenkins listening. So there's a Git hook here that is now tying in our warnings at least 
at this compile stage. We're generating all of those warnings that you just saw in the development environment, which is good. So let's take a quick look through our pre-commit slides. We'll let this run for a second. And then we'll come back and fix these problems and actually see our build warnings, the security specific ones showing up in the actual build pipeline for our security folks. So let's flip back to you. Go ahead. Yeah, when you run MS build, if you have this analyzer installed on the project, it automatically runs all of the security analyzers. You don't have to do anything except install the NuGet package with each project which is huge. So it plays nicely with the builds that are already going on. I don't have to do anything extra. Now I am going to add a step here in a minute. And I'll show you what it's going to do that parses these specific security warnings out of the build results so we can make a more informed decision on the health of the build. But in our DevOps world, the static analysis checklist will look something like this. We need to display the vulnerabilities in the IDE. We achieve that. So I just showed you how that looks. Check, we've got the warnings in there. We also need to provide documentation to make it easy to fix the issue. Check, we've got the link that does that. And the last section is getting rid of false positives. I have not showed you how to do that yet. So that's what we'll hit next here once I get this build working. So let's go back to our VM and let's find that false positive. So here's our build. Let me make sure this is good. So it's just finishing its publish phase, but if I zoom in on the compile, you'll see that we've actually got the 66 new warnings. And those are all of the security warnings that were discovered during the MS build phase. So we now have the data in our CI pipeline, which is step one. If I come in here and let's suppress this false positive. So to suppress one, all you have to do is right click on one of these warnings and we can say suppress this in a suppression file. And what that does is it's going to create this new file that lives with your source code repository. So here is the file that it just created called global suppression. It's just a class and you can come in here and actually track the false positives. Now, some engineers might just try to suppress everything in order to pass your build. So I mentioned monitoring high risk code earlier for a reason. This particular file should be considered high risk code in your build pipeline. If this file changes, if the hash changes, you should be firing off notifications to security folks and they should be coming in here to actually approve that deployment after they verify that yes, this is truly a false positive. So from a security perspective, you have to monitor this closely. Let's pretend that I looked at this. So I'm gonna say Eric says, this is cool, right? That actually is a false positive. And we'll save this file. You'll notice the warnings have already dropped in the IDE from 66 to 65. So it's already gone away. To fix that, all you do after that is do your normal commit. So let's go ahead and commit some code again. And we'll say suppressed false positive. And I know my typing is terrible right now, so commit anyway. All I want to show you is that warning dropping off in the build. So we'll let this run again. And while that's running, we'll flip over to see what else we need to be doing in the pipeline itself. So the build is kicking off. It's running again. We'll take a look at that here in a minute. So pre-commit, we've accomplished our goals, which is flag things as soon as they're written. As soon as you write something bad, it shows up. We're giving you documentation and the ability to suppress problems. So engineers can handle that. Let's talk about what's happening in CI here from a static analysis perspective. In a perfect world, we would not actually need to verify that all of these things were fixed because we could just trust all of the engineers to do the right thing and fix all the issues. In anyone's experience, do the engineering teams actually do that? Unfortunately not. So the whole premise behind security and DevOps is that you can trust people to do the right thing, but when your auditor comes and you have to talk to them about why this is okay in a PCI regulated environment, for example, 
you had better be verifying these in your pipeline and providing that compensating control to the auditor. So step one is the pipeline needs to actually execute those scans again. You need to capture the results so you can show them exactly what showed up during each bill. You can also set thresholds up to monitor the health. So maybe you will allow 100 low risk issues to go through. And that's what your organization says. We're okay with this from a risk tolerance perspective. We'll let 100 lows go through in maybe 15 mediums. But if any high risk issue shows up, that's absolutely not tolerable. We're going to fail to build. So you can also enforce those thresholds right there in your pipeline so those things automatically fail. And as Tom put it earlier, whoever did it has to go buy beer or bring in donuts until somebody else fails it next. That's the game we play. You also need to notify security teams when issues are suppressed or high risk things are showing up. And that's all very uh, actually easy to automate in any of the CI tools. That's where security needs to be focusing in the DevOps world. We have a huge opportunity to plug all of these security things in and automate them to tell us when bad things are going on. So what we'll do in a moment is actually add a new step into the pipeline. We're going to add the Puma scan step to evaluate all of the security rules that showed up. Very quick, we'll change two Jenkins jobs and we'll fire that up. When you click on the results of that, we will actually see all of the security warnings right there within Jenkins. So now the operations and InfoSec folks don't need to go download Visual Studio and run all of those rules on their own. They can come into Jenkins as the repository and see them all right here from within the CI pipeline. If bad things happen, we will fail. That's why that's red. That's what it means when you have to go buy donuts or whatever. And then we'll fix those code issues and we'll watch the build pass again. So that's kind of the end of the talk for the next 10 minutes or so. That's what we'll do before we wrap things up. All right, so let's go back into this. Our pipeline is still passing because we're not enforcing the rules. So let's take a look at compile again. You'll notice it says we've got 66 warnings. We fixed one of them. So the one fixed warning is the one that we suppressed right before we committed this. So we're now tracking these changes over time, which is very cool from a metrics perspective. When the management team comes to you and says, how are we doing on fixing security issues? You now have a historical graph of, look, we're fixing five a week and we're slowly improving and getting better. All that data is in the actual pipeline. The next step is enforcing this. So let me go into Jenkins, and I have a rule in here that I pre-created called uh, conveniently Puma scan to self-describe, and let's change this. So if you're not familiar with Jenkins, what I will tell you is that we have this delivery pipeline project installed or plugin and we're just going to say, I want the Puma scan to run in the verification phase, which is right before we publish the artifact. The task name, we'll call it Puma scan, and we'll say enforce some rules or something cool like that. And then we're going to come down and actually say, when does this get triggered? So after our compilation step is when we actually want this to run. So if I come in here and I choose run this after the widget town build has succeeded, we'll now be checking security warnings right after the build. That's where we want to do it. So that's all I have to do in this step is to change that. And then we have to monitor one more or change one more task. So right now this is showing up in that pipeline. We've got the security rule in there, but we need to tell our publish step to not run after compile anymore. We now need to tell it to run after the Puma scan step. So that's the second change. Let's click on this. We'll go ahead and edit this task. We'll go into configure and go down to its build trigger. And you'll notice right now, its build trigger is set to go after widget town demo build. Instead, we'll change that to Puma scan which will make sure that our publish step does not go unless the rule security step is actually passing. So those are the two quick changes we'll make to our pipeline. So now we've got the step in place right here. That's the security step that you should be thinking about 
from the DevOps perspective as the security person, what can I add to their pipeline to enforce security day in and day out every time there's a commit that happens? This is how we can start playing within their rules of engagement, we'll call it. So let's run this. Now what we'll do is kind of just kick off the process again. So let's just fix one item and then we'll kick it off so we can actually see the build fail. So who knows how to fix a cross-site scripting issue? I know you didn't think you'd have to do this when you woke up this morning. What's that? Input validation is step one. Does anybody know the true solution? Constraining user input is always a good idea in general. Yeah, output encoding or output escaping, whatever you want to call it. What we need to do is actually HTML encode this because it's being rendered in a browser that we need to tell the browser, this is data. Don't execute a script if you see it. Display a script because that's what the data is. So we'll do an encode, coder.html encode, and put our parenthesis around here, and voila, that little green warning is now gone. How cool is that? The IDE tells you, you did something good today for security. Pat yourself on the back, and let's play this game again. Let's see, we've got 60 more, 64 more other things that we need to fix. We won't do them all. We just have to get better incrementally. That's the goal. So if I push this change out, let's say we fixed one XSS issue, commit, and let's push this. So if we look back in our pipeline, we're running this again. And now the Puma scan enforcing step is in place. So what should happen here when we've got 64 warnings? We probably should fail. And I'll tell you wh where that's set up at. The step itself, if I go to the configure for this again, if you're not a Jenkins expert, you don't need to be, but I'll just show you what I did. So in the advanced scan for compiler warnings phase, I came down in here and just for demo purposes, I said, okay, here's what I want you to do. Mark the build as unhealthy if there's more than 30 warnings and fail it if there's more than 60. So we've got 64 right now, we're gonna fail. So while this is running, let's go fix the rest of those vulnerabilities real quick. And we'll come back to this here in a minute. So task one is done. How do you fix SQL injection? Parameterize the query. Now this is running against .NET's ORM framework, their object relational mapping framework. So this automatically parameterizes things if you don't do something stupid. This code is doing something stupid on purpose. So if we just get rid of this whole string concatenation thing and just leave this little curly brace right here, that's a parameter. And all I have to do is pass the ID in in the second argument and that is now a parameterized query. So we've now fixed what is one of the most detrimental web app vulnerabilities that you could possibly push out into production. We're down to 63 now, folks. We're getting there. What about a file path manipulation issue? Any ideas on this one? Again, constraining user input is a good idea here. What I would typically recommend is don't let the user control the file path. That's typically a good place to start. If you make them indirectly choose a numeric value and then you go look up the associated path on a secured backend repository, that is also a good way to make sure that that doesn't happen. So in this case, we'll change this to an integer and I'll just convert it to a string and voila. Now I can't put dot dot slash in the integer. So that one's gone. And we'll play this game a little bit longer. This is the easiest one. Should lock out should probably be set to what? True would be a better value for this. So let's pick true. Oh, and that one is now gone. Look at all the AppSec work you're doing today. This is even easier than the last one. What should we do with this certificate, val uh, disabling the certificate validation part? Uh, comment, perhaps? Or just delete in general. Never, ever, ever do that. So we'll save that. Now that one's gone. And we're down to 60 on the nose. So look, in just a very short amount of time, we should now pass the build. And I'm not saying 60 is what you should do in real life. This is a demo. 
So pick the appropriate number that matches your organization's risk tolerance. Here's the results from our scan with just one fixed. So we'll click on this. Notice, hey, you had 64 issues. It's over 60. That's why we failed. Let's go ahead and commit our changes just one more time. And we'll say we fixed five or four more issues. And we'll commit all of these changes, sync them up, push them out to the repo. And we go back and watch our pipeline do all the heavy lifting and this should actually pass. That is what security needs to be doing in a DevOps world. On the Java side, Sonar has security rules. So Find Bugs has a plugin called Find Security Bugs that looks for a lot of security specific problems. And there is a Find Bugs plugin for Jenkins specifically. Yeah, Find Bugs will also run on the IDE. And there's a Find Bugs plugin for Jenkins. So when you go and you run your Java or your Maven build, it will execute Find Bugs also at that point in time and give you access to the same sort of data. But yeah, Sonar, I have not seen Sonar security results. Do you, you think they do a pretty good job on there? Yeah, yeah. I typically advocate for using Sonar to be your repo for all of the data. And then you could feed the Puma info into Sonar and let that be where you send tickets out and do a lot of those things from a kind of a general code health perspective. Any other questions? I'll open it up at this point while we kind of watch this thing actually do work here. This is how easy security is in DevOps. Should security be in the PRs as far as the In a pull request? Yes. And that is a huge compensating control in, especially if you're regulated. You have to have pull requests that trigger peer reviews. And whether it's a, like a security you know, champion that does in, like software engineering on a day in and day out basis that you trust to do those reviews, or it's someone on the dedicated AppSec team, it's different everywhere. That is a compensating control that you will not get past most compliance without. So, you know, like Etsy, for example, they're PCI regulated and they, you know, are on the whole I deploy code a bazillion times a day or whatever. But their PCI pipeline absolutely has that code review step in it. Pretty common at Twitter also is a full out, you know, sec DevOps shop and not a single piece of code goes into production there without somebody peer reviewing it and looking at it first. That's a huge compensating control. Great question. Go ahead. So if we modify, oh, so if I go in and just completely change that file and it moves around uh, from a line number perspective enough. Well, not necessarily from line number, let's say that uh, you completely change an SQL query. Right, but right. So in that, so it's been suppressed and verified, but let's say we go back and accidentally reintroduce it. If the sync, and I'll show you the info in that file, the way that it tracks that is based on, let me find that global suppression file. So if you go in here, it actually is the class that it's in and it's got the method that it's in and that's where it's knowing to go locate that. So it is feasible that within the same method, if you do that, we could potentially kind of skirt around that and reintroduce something. Uh, it would be, it's something I haven't actually tested very. Okay. So it doesn't contain the actual. Yeah, it's definitely not, here's the line number and file. And if so I change it, it's coming so back. Could you like do some kind of like a hash on that segment of code? And sure. Your... Yeah, the other option, which I didn't show you. So if I go get rid of this, oop, that's not the button I want to push. So let's say I delete this line here. And now that issue is going to come back because I've deleted that in the suppression file. So that was in, I want to say, here it is right here. The other option is you can actually suppress it in line. If I say suppress it in the source is the option I'm clicking on here. It will modify the actual file and kind of do what you're describing, which is on this individual line. We'll suppress it here. So at least you have better visibility into if that changes. So maybe if I'm going to actually change something within this segment, maybe we get rid of the suppression and make sure that all is well before we re-edit back. You could certainly, as Tom mentioned, do your own hashing on the file or something and say, if, 
Yeah, and say if the hash on this line changes, let's turn that suppression rule off. That would definitely be a good thing to keep in mind, absolutely. So what do these rules look like? What do they look like? So they, they're all in GitHub, and I'll pull one up if you really want to see it. That's what that other talk I referenced, the OWASP uh, AppSec USA talk. I actually went through and taught for an hour people how to write a rule to identify that, uh, like a password complexity misconfiguration. And I thought it was fun, but a lot of the room, I think when they see lots of slides with code on them, I think I overwhelmed some folks. So, uh, but it's definitely out in YouTube. Uh, the big... Absolutely. No, no, you have to do this all manually. So we've written about 50 analyzers that go in, and this is just, here's a dump of all the bad things Eric has seen in 15 years of looking at crappy code dumped into like 50 rules at least to start with. So that's where I'm coming up with the rules. Now, a lot of them are very well documented on OWASP and things like that on what to look for. Uh, but this is just me and the other folks doing it saying we see this stuff all the time and it'd be great if maybe there was something that said we shouldn't do that. So now we're passing. I'll get out of the VM and I can pull that repo up if you want to take a peek at it. So let's just drop through our quick conclusion stuff here and then I'll just open it up. We've got about, what, five minutes left? Three minutes left according to our timekeeper. So again, this is open source. If you want to see the code, it's in GitHub. Go look at it. I've gotten a lot of emails saying, hey, I wish this rule did this. And I said, the whole reason I open sourced this was so you could do that yourself. I don't have time to babysit all of them. That's why it's open source. So I'm welcoming contributions. If you send me a pull request, I'll put it in the repo. That's totally cool. I'd love to have people write, uh, especially if you're working in this framework, add them back. Uh, I've got a couple things that I haven't got to yet. I need to add a lot of crypto rules, kind of identifying bad algorithms and weak key links and stuff like that. The secrets manager would be good. Uh, we have some research going into getting better taint analysis put into the rules, which is where maybe we're tracking if it comes from a static configuration file versus a request parameter and eliminating false positives that way. Uh, acknowledgements. Eric Mead is a local security engineer uh, who is like a, he took my very ugly proof of concept code and actually made it look like a real actual source code repository that's got like dependency injection and all this cool crap going on that I would never use without him. So he's been a huge help. The guys at Microsoft actually were a huge help as I was trying to figure out how to write these analyzers and figure out what they do. It's awesome that they open source the framework because I looked on GitHub and said, here's the last two guys to commit to the Roslyn repository. And I emailed them and asked them a question and they responded within an hour. It's amazing. And then Gitter, does anyone use Gitter just for chatting? It's, it's basically a, a chat room associated with a Git project. There's Roslyn engineers on there every day and you can just ask them questions and they'll answer them just right on the spot if they're available. So that wraps everything up. Uh, let's see, we've got one or two minutes left. Any other questions? And I'll, I'll stick around for a while too if you want to. I can show you the, the analyzer code maybe offline if you want to take a peek at it. That's your crash course. So easy, right? That's all you got to do, at least in one framework. I'll let you guys go figure the rest of them out. Do you have other recommendations for like dynamic analysis? For dynamic analysis? That's a tough one, especially in, uh, in a DevOps pipeline, because dynamic scanning can take a while, as most of us have know, know that we've seen those. I actually saw, so at, in uh, Black Hat Asia, I was out in Singapore, I don't remember when it was, a few weeks ago, and uh, Seth Law from Invisium, who works with Dave Linder, who did a talk this morning, he released a little, uh, it's like an acceptance testing framework called Sputter, and his goal is to be fast dynamic scanning. So he actually, based on the framework, auto launches, if it's Java, it'll auto launch a Java web server and then do acceptance testing against the Java app. And it also supports .NET, Python, and three or four other frameworks. But he's using very condensed fuzzing lists. Like, so for cross-site scripting, he's just doing about seven characters. Less than, greater than, ampersand, tick mark, double quote. And if any of those come back unencoded, he knows that they're not encoding output. So 
that might be where I would recommend starting if you're looking for very fast, efficient, more fuzzing sort of scanning. From a more automated point and click perspective, there's probably nothing really good that's going to sit in a pipeline like that without blocking things up for hours at a time. So I think I would definitely recommend leaning on that out of band scanning that feeds issues back into the backlog is probably the best recommendation I could give there. But you definitely need something, some sort of fuzzing test to make sure that at least the, the top 10 sort of issues don't end up in production because that's what the whole goal of this is supposed to achieve is making sure that never happens. Any other questions? You're ready to shut it off, aren't you? Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, that, uh, that wraps it up.